Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum. These are five pages of questions from the awesome folks who support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon, and this is a wee dram of Guyana Eldorado Demerara rum, which is really good and uh, should set this off in the right direction. So let's just get started. Uh, my first question is from Bryce who says, if you were to outfit a modern squad with your choice of modern rifles, machine guns, and pistols, what would you pick? Uh, first off, I'm very happy that uh, this question was limited to the unit size of a single squad, because that allows me to not have to deal with the idea of what like company level heavy or general purpose machine gun. That question gets a little bit tricky. Uh, I know traditionally I would often have said the PKM, but what I'm going to say for the squad is going to change that a little bit in my mind. So uh, for a, a military squad I would say pistol, Glock, or whatever your preference, doesn't really matter. Glock's kind of an obvious, like they're the most popular. It'd be a service size gun, something no smaller than a Glock 19, um, quite possibly a Glock 17, or modern equivalent, or, or more. You know, they've, they're starting to come out with ones that have various sets of 19 and 17 grip and slide set you know, lengths. Doesn't matter, service size, 9mm Glock would be just peachy. Uh, rifle would be an AR-15 variant. I would go with a direct impingement gun rather than a piston gun, uh, unless there was some particular reason that I was going to need to use suppressors a lot or have a lot of very short barreled carbines. Typically I'd say 14 and a half to 16 inch barrels would be ideal. Uh, good optics mount on them for all sorts of both day and night optics. And then machine gun wise I would say a Knight's uh, light assault machine gun in 5.56. That's something that I actually just recently had the chance to do a bunch of shooting with, and there is a video on that coming, but it's about two weeks out uh, from when this video posts. Uh, although, by the way, that video is already edited and uploaded and scheduled, and so those Patreons, those folks on Patreon, uh, who are in the $20 a month perk level to get early access to videos, you guys have already gotten access to that video and you can see it. So uh, if you're in that group, go check out that Light Assault Machine Gun video, because that's a really cool gun. And to my mind, it would be a much better uh, squad automatic weapon than the M249 or really anything else that's out there right now. Uh, it's its limitation, I suppose, is that it's not great for heavy volumes of sustained fire, but man, for what it is good at, it is excellent at. It is extremely controllable, has a nice low rate of fire, uh, it's light, it's handy, it's a really cool, really impressive gun. And so I would say that and some variant on the M4 carbine and Glock would make for a very nicely outfitted modern military squad. So the reason that the PKM gets to be a trickier choice at this point is because now Traditionally I would have said the PKM as a squad light machine gun, even though it's in a different, you know, a larger caliber cartridge than the squad rifles. Well that Knight's light assault machine gun takes takes over that role really well, and it means the PKM would now not so much be a squad automatic weapon, but it would be more of a general purpose machine gun. And at that point, if it's not the gun that you have guys running around with right next to riflemen, maybe you're looking at something that's a little better set up specifically for sustained fire, and maybe at that point you should look more towards something like an FN mag that is a heavier gun, uh, heavier barrel, better tripod setup. Not, if I could only own you know one of these guns personally myself it would be a PKM in this class because it is a more universal gun, but if you've got a a night slide assault machine gun in the squad, you don't necessarily want a completely universal 7.62 caliber machine gun as well. So that question gets a little tricky at that point. Anyway, uh, next up is from Mitchell, who wants to know uh, my favorite uh, favorite non-firearms location, historical site, or event you've seen abroad. And it occurs to me when I read through this at first I didn't actually really clearly read event in there and I was thinking just location or historical site, so I'm going to go with just those two, and I'm going to say the Hypogeum on Malta. I had the chance to uh, to visit there, thanks very much to the Malta Tourism Authority who managed to get me tickets, uh, which I 
in no way should have been able to get access to. Uh, the Hypogeum is a roughly 4,500 year old burial site. It is a three level uh, complex that was dug below ground on Malta. Um, in an area kind of overlooking the, the Grand Harbor in Malta. It was discovered in 1902 by a couple of uh, people building a house, and of course on Malta the first thing you do when you build a house is you dig a cistern to store water in, and then you use the stone that you excavate from that cistern to build your house. Well, they had some workmen digging a cistern, and the workmen broke through into this big underground complex um, that was 4,000 years ago used as a burial site. And what's really interesting about this, first off, it's entirely dug out of Maltese limestone. Um, it is not a natural cave complex, it is a completely human built or human dug structure um, underground. They didn't have metal tools. This predates the use of you know human metalworking. So this whole thing was dug out using things like antler and harder stone than the limestone that was all red, that, that made up the the terrain there. So the amount of work that had to go into creating this place is really kind of phenomenal. And then the architecture inside was, the whole place was carved to duplicate the megalithic stone structures above ground. So structures, most the, the most common thing we would think of in this sort of realm would be like Stonehenge. Think about those, and they want to duplicate that underground. And what they would actually do is they would carve pillars into the wall. These weren't actual supporting pillars, they were just aesthetic features, you know, a little bit of a relief carving to make it look like a pillar. And they actually carved a lot of them in curved shapes instead of straight up and down in order specifically, and it works, it does this, in order to give it sort of this fisheye type perspective to make it look larger and more three-dimensional sort of. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, they carved some of the roof structures that would have existed at the time on the above ground megalithic structures. You think of what was the what was the roof structure on Stonehenge? Well, we have no idea. None of that stuff has survived. Well, the Hypogeum in Malta is the best example of what that would have looked like. So I did not film anything there because photography and video is prohibited. They have some pretty strict controls on how many people can get into it. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And in order to preserve the structure and the wall paintings, there's like 4,000 year old wall paintings that still survive in there. And to preserve that, they're very strictly controlling the humidity and the temperature. And they let in, it's less than 100 people per day on scheduled tours. Uh, the lighting in there, you know, they have lights that are kind of timed to your tour. So as, you're, as you walk into an area, lights will come on. And then as you move out of that area, the lights go off. So that there's a minimum amount of light pollution inside that would allow like growth of, of algaes, that sort of thing. So typically tickets for, for the Hypogeum tours sell out like four months in advance. Um, I was, like I said, I was thanks to the, the Malta Tourism Bureau, uh, they, they got me into one of the tours. But I would highly, highly recommend if you're ever going to go to Malta, which is a pretty cool place by the way, a lot of history there from all sorts of different eras. Um, but if you're going to go, as soon as you know your travel dates, uh, look up the Hypogeum and get yourself tickets. It's relatively expensive, but for what you're seeing, it just just do it. It's a fantastic, fascinating site. Uh, Jacob has our next question. He asked, what is my schedule like? How many hours do I work each week? I thought about it. I think I work about probably 70 hours a week when I'm at home. Um, I will typically wake up at five, give or take. The schedule varies a little bit based on the season when the sun comes up, but I'll usually wake up at five and do an hour, maybe an hour and a half of work before I get out of bed. And that's um, social media stuff. It's a lot of kind of routine maintenance sort of work. Um, so email correspondence, commentary, social media stuff. I do a bunch of that before I even get out of bed. Uh, get up, have breakfast, uh, work out or run uh, for half an hour or so. And then off to work, take a break at around noon for lunch, go back to work, and I'll usually be done 5 or 6 p.m. in the evening. So I think that comes out to probably about 10 hours a day total. Um, usually once I've had dinner I'm done working for the day, although I occasionally have phone calls to make, or if I'm doing like Skype stuff with people on different continents, time zones mean that sometimes I'll do work later in the evening or, or early in the morning. Um, 
I, if I, when I'm doing reading, it tends to be in the evening, so I may be reading some history book that's related to work in the evening. These days I'm trying to spend more time in the evenings practicing French uh, with some, some online phone apps. That's something that I'm really trying to, to push. I'd really like to, to get to the point where I'm at least conversational in French. So that's pretty much my day, and that is a, that's seven days a week. So I kind of lose track of whether it's a weekday or a weekend. So fortunately, all the stuff that I'm doing is stuff that I really enjoy doing, so it I haven't burned out yet. So far so good. Maybe the rum helps. Next up is uh, Ryan says, uh, what advantages does the toggle locking system have over other conventional systems, and do you think there could be any modern advantageous uses for this type of action today? I've been thinking about this and I cannot come up with any real advantage for the toggle lock system. They do work. Um, you know, the Luger is a perfect example. It worked quite well, but it was expensive. And I can't think of any good, any reason to justify that extra expense given what we know about handgun or rifle design today. Uh, definitely, you, it's going to be easier to justify in a handgun just because toggle locked basically it doesn't have to be. Um, combined with a short recoil system, but it generally is. Most of the historical ones are, and short recoil in a rifle is uh, definitely not the most efficient way to, to operate a gun. So in a handgun, it's like, you know, it's a lot more expensive than a Browning type tilting barrel, and I can't come up with any good benefit that you get back out of it. So I think that's that's exactly why nobody's really done any work building toggle locked guns since the Luger and the Johnson. Uh, Matt says, what is your choice for best personal defense weapon, PS90 or MP7, or maybe something different? Well, uh, we actually just, I think we took this exact same question on the recent in-range Q&A where he was asking just about uh, the P90 versus the MP7. Uh, the answer to that is P90, in my opinion. However, for when you say personal defense weapon, I would give some serious consideration to something like a Scorpion as well. Um, yeah, it's in 32 ACP. It has half the magazine capacity of either of the other options, but it is a much more compact gun. It's more compact than either of those other two, a lot more compact than a P90. It's very controllable. The stock is re it's sort of mostly usable. Um, I found it a more pleasant gun to shoot than the MP7. That said, once you get to the point of having a Scorpion as a PDW, then you kind of have to ask, like, is there really a good reason to have this instead of, say, a Glock 19 with a red dot on it, especially something like one of the new um, Aimpoint Acros? At that point, you know, full auto is almost never as good as semi-auto, and so a good semi-auto service pistol with a good red dot sighting system, I think you can really, you could certainly make the argument that that is a better personal defense weapon than an iron sighted machine pistol. Christopher says, do you think there could be a resurgence in rocket ball or gyro jet type ammo as the push for caseless ammo continues? Nope, I really don't think there ever will be a resurgence in rocket ball type ammo. And the reason is it's accelerating, it continues to accelerate after it leaves the barrel, which means it has fundamental accuracy problems. Uh, things like wind, like uh, it's in the barrel much, that kind of ammunition stays in the barrel accelerating for a much longer period of time than a typical uh, conventional bullet. It's not very long, but it's many times as long as a bullet. And that means that if, with a bullet pretty much, um, once you pull the trigger, the bullet's almost immediately out of the barrel. And you don't have to worry that much about making sure that you don't move while the bullet's traveling down the barrel. Uh, this was something, by the way, that you do have to worry about with, say, flintlock um, firearms, where there's a pretty discernible period of time between when you pull the trigger and when the bullet actually leaves, although a lot of that time is spent with the, the flintlock action actually firing, not as much with the bullet um, accelerating down the barrel, but if you're wobbling the gun around when you pull the trigger on a flintlock, you know, you're gonna, you can potentially have one point of aim when you pull the trigger and a different point of aim when the bullet actually leaves the muzzle. 
And with a gyrojet you've got that same problem. So you combine that with the fact that, say, heavily gusting wind can actually have a significant impact on your accuracy, because the muzzle velocity of a gyrojet was something like 30 feet per second. Like you, I, If I understand it correctly, if you shot someone literally point blank with a gyrojet it would not break the skin. And so that means that you know, wind can dramatically affect where that bullet's actually going to go differently from round to round to round. So for those reasons, no, I don't think the, the rocket ammunition, until we figured out a way to make it like self-aiming and be able to, to change path in flight, until then, no, rocket ball's not, not a viable path forward. John says, any thoughts about a possible collaboration with Time Ghost, similar to Athias doing small arms videos for the Great War? Uh, there was, actually. They originally, the Time Ghost World War II project was supposed to be a giant collaboration of like eight different channels, and um, InRange TV was actually one of them. And our plan was to do a lot of practical handling videos. Um, and we were hoping that Othias would also be taking part, and the idea was Othias would do a lot of the history and development of World War II firearms, and then Carl and I would go out in the field with them and, and demonstrate how they were actually used in a practical manner. And we had, I would say, major communications and logistical issues with uh, Indian Spartacus at Time Ghost, and the project completely fell apart, and that is why we are not part of it. Uh, I see glimmers here and there of channels who are still sort of collaborating with Time Ghost, but it doesn't look like they're still, even, even after the thing got started, it doesn't look like any of it's really a collaboration, it's more synchronous, occasional synchronous posting, which is unfortunate. Um, the original idea was really exciting, it was going to be really cool to have an actual coordinated multi-channel World War II massive documentary project, and that just fell through um, for logistical reasons. Uh, Alexi says, you have done hundreds upon hundreds of videos about machine guns, yet have done practically none on aerial machine guns, auto cannons, and gun pods. While I know most are adapted from ground-based firearms, I also know most have to be uh, extensively modified to operate under high g-force. Is the lack of content based on lack of availability or something else? Uh, it is partly lack of availability, it's partly lack of information about them. Uh, in the collector community there are very few people who are actually actively collecting uh, aerial guns, because once you get past World War I, uh, you've got guns that you can't really shoot, and you've got guns that you know, most of them look very similar. They're kind of just like long oblong boxes that have some wires sticking out the back and a muzzle sticking out the front. They're rare to find. They didn't often get taken home as souvenirs by soldiers. Uh, they don't generally get surplused um, because military aircraft don't generally get surplus, and when military aircraft are destroyed the guns are typically destroyed with them, scrapped with them. So there are some out there. It's a subject I would really like to do more coverage of, uh, but finding the guns is hard, and then learning about them is hard, because for the same reason that the, the same sort of problems that I have accessing them, a lot of authors have, uh, have the same problems, and it's there just isn't a lot of scholarship out there on uh, aerial firearms. So there is one really good book on US aerial machine guns that I actually did a book review of here recently. That's going to be a really important source for me if and when I'm able to get access to some of these things. But if I can make that happen I will, but I have no idea when that might be. Gregory says, I notice you tend to post a variety of videos, be they from HK, Switzerland, South Africa, Rock Island, Morphe's, etc. How many videos do you usually have on backlog just in case? That's a really good question. Uh, what I try to do when I make a, take a major trip is get a week of filming, and I'll try to do four to six videos per day. So I will come back from a week-long serious trip somewhere, hopefully with about 25 videos. And I'm not going to run all of those back to back, I learned my lesson on that a long time ago. And what I try to do instead is, is keep a couple trips um, basically in the queue. So in a given week I can give you one video from SIG, and one video from South Africa, and one video from HK, or Canada, or whatever trip I may have taken. Um, now it's a little bit different with the auction companies, Morphe and Rock Island. When I do a video series there, those are tied to a specific, uh, you know, 
auction that's coming up. And so I do run all of those back to back. And that tends not to be the same problem as, as running other content back to back, because an auction trip is going to be a wide variety of different guns. Whereas a specific filming trip usually is a, a group of guns that have some very specific commonality. So HK guns are all HK. My South Africa trip was all focused on guns made in South Africa, because they're accessible there and nowhere else. Uh, so the auction, auction stuff gets run all as a single, single run. Um, right now I have, I think, about 60 or 70 videos that have been filmed but not scheduled or posted. And I really like having that much backlog. Um, it's not so much that I'm afraid of running out of material, and I want to have that there as a buffer to use up. What I like about it instead is that it really allows me to, to keep a variety of guns. Modern stuff, very old stuff, you know, World War I, World War II stuff, pistols, shotguns, machine guns. I like to try and keep everything varied for you guys, and having a large backlog helps me do that. Um, I also typically don't cover guns that I own in my own collection, with the notion that if I do have a, a problem at some point and I run out of backlogged material, I will have easy access to those that I can film right on the spot. So that's why there are some, some guns that you would think I would have done. Um, like the CZ-52 and 5257 is a good example. I haven't done those. They do show up at auctions. Um, but I also own examples of each myself, and they're, they're one of the guns that I'm kind of setting aside as, you know, for a rainy day when, oh no, I'm out of content and I need something specific, well, those two are there and I can get them easily. Phil says, could 6mm Lee have been an effective round that didn't destroy barrels had it come later with better barrel steel or better propellant powders? Yes, it absolutely could have. Um, so this is the 6mm Lee Navy cartridge introduced in 1895, and it was a remarkably small bore for the time and remarkably high velocity for the time. However, by today's standards it doesn't really, it's not particularly small bore, nor is it particularly high velocity. Uh, the military load was 135 grain bullet at 2500 feet per second, uh, which today, by today's standards for a 6mm that's a very heavy bullet. Uh, if you look at 243 Winchester, uh, we typically have bullets that are three quarters or less the mass, traveling substantially faster. So had they had modern access to more modern powders or more modern barrel steels, the bore ero or the throat erosion that was one of the major problems with the, the Lee Navy rifle could absolutely have been avoided. I think it's worth also pointing out though that the Lee Navy had a lot of parts breakage issues. It was not just bore erosion. Uh, that led to it being fairly quickly replaced. Joshua says, what are your thoughts on helical magazine designs? The only two firearms I'm aware of that made use of them are the Calico and the Russian Bison. Um, were helical magazines unreliable, impractical, surely no more clumsy than drums? Why do you think we don't see them more? I think the answer is they're unreliable. Uh, even traditional drums we don't see all that much use of, because they're pretty difficult to make thoroughly 100% reliable, and the helical drums are just that much more difficult, because you're moving cartridges in two different dimensions, or in, actually in three dimensions. A normal drum is typically just rotating a stack like this, or horizontally. With the helical mags you're rotating you know, one direction, and you're also cycling all of those cartridges forward at the same time. And it's just a lot harder to make that completely reliable. We have very high standards for magazine reliability, and if you, you know, let's say you get 99% reliability on a helical magazine that holds 50 rounds, that means every other time you reload you're going to get a malfunction in that magazine, and people simply wouldn't accept that. Especially when you can say instead of two 50 round mags we'll have three 30 round or 32 round stick mags, and we'll get zero malfunctions because we know how to make them very very well. Next page. Uh, Andrew says, will there ever be a time when US import laws on firearms get loosened, and if so, will foreign firearm companies like Daewoo, Norinco, or Valmet want to export to the US market again? The answer to both parts of that is like, potentially, but probably not. So um, the, the ban on US import of military pattern or military style assault rifles 
um, which aren't actually assault rifles. A true assault rifle is select fire. What we have in the US is a 1989 era uh, presidential executive decision uh, to prohibit importation of military looking firearms on the basis that they are not suitable for sporting use. Uh, that was George Bush Sr. Uh, who passed that into law, who dictated it, and that could be reversed on a whim by any subsequent President of the United States. It is a directive to the Treasury Department that certain types of guns are not uh, fit for sporting use. The, the law instructs that importation is allowed for guns of sporting use. So if you were to come back and say, hmm, you know, AR-15s are highly are, are widely and extensively used in sporting competition in the United States, and thus they would be legal to import, then all of a sudden we could import AR-15s from other countries. So as a practical matter, this has not really done anything to change the availability of firearms in a general sense in the United States, because it has no impact on what can be manufactured here. The reason for that is when this executive order was signed, the president, the executive branch, has control over allowing what can be imported into the United States, and that doesn't become a constitutional issue. What is a constitutional issue is trying to dictate what can be manufactured in the United States. And so this import uh, decision has nothing, has no impact on domestic American production. So if, now this is where things get a little bit complicated, if that went away, which it easily could, would we get import of a lot of new firearms that we can't get right now? And the answer is not necessarily. Like in theory, yes, in a legal sense we could, but the companies that really wanted to sell this sort of rifle in the United States have already found the workaround, and that is manufacture them in the United States. And so we have HK in the United States, we have FN in the United States, we have a lot of these companies, and anything that they want to sell in the US, they can as long as they make it here. So if that import restriction went away, for example, it's possible we could buy semi-auto HK 433s from Germany if they decided that they wanted to sell them here. Uh, and there are some smaller companies that, well, China and Norinco is probably the biggest example. Um, they would I'm sure love to sell us a bunch of, of military pattern stuff that we can't get right now. But companies like Valmet, for example, uh, or saint -Tienne, you know, we got a batch of semi-auto FAMAS rifles here in the US prior to that import ban, but that company doesn't exist anymore. There aren't semi-auto FAMAS rifles being made anymore. There aren't Valmet rifles really being made anymore, not in the way that they were when that import ban took effect. So a lot of the potential imports aren't around to be imported. Uh, and a lot of, remember that changing that would not change the one of the other legal standards we have, namely that once a gun is a machine gun, it is always a machine gun, which is to say that in the United States you cannot convert a machine gun into a semi-auto rifle. And that is the way that a lot of military pattern rifles exist in civilian ownership in the rest of the world. They will take a full auto G3 and just modify it so you can't put it into full auto mode, and then it becomes legally a semi-auto rifle. And that standard is not recognized in the United States. So that's your answer. Could change, but it might not change even if it did change. Uh, Tyler says, this may be covered in your upcoming book, however, do you know who modified Berthier rifles and carbines with a safety? I've seen plenty of the modified Berthiers on auction sites with what looks like identical safeties. I know what you're talking about, Tyler, um, but I don't know who did it. Um, I'm pretty sure, it, I'm quite certain, it was a US importer at some point. Just like we have Tokarev pistols that were modified with one of a couple different versions of manual safety in order to meet import requirements, I suspect that those rifles were modified that way by some particular importer who thought that it would make them more uh, commercially appealing if they added a manual safety because the Berthier doesn't have one by default. Um, I've actually seen a couple different versions of them. Um, there's one that has a safety back by the tang that's cut through the top of the stock. And I've also seen them with a, a very simple safety behind the trigger that just blocks the trigger at the back of the trigger guard. Um, it's not covered in my book because it is not a French military thing that was done. Um, it is something I would like to find out more about though. Uh, Aaron 
wants to know what book on the subject of broom handles would I recommend, preferably both German and Spanish. Um, I don't have one to recommend. Uh, there is no good book on broom handle mousers. There are a couple of books out there, but to my mind they are all um, way too expensive because they're basically all out of print and they are not nearly informative enough to justify the cost um, of them. If you're interested in the Spanish ones, Leonardo Antares' book on the Astra uh, is probably your single best choice because he covers a lot of the different Spanish models, but doesn't go into serious detail on the German ones because it's a book about Spanish pistols and it's like 800 pages long to begin with. Um, I do know that there is a book, what I think is going to be an excellent book on the broom handles, being written, uh, and I look forward to that being available because I will be really excited to have it myself because I don't know of a good one right now. Uh, the one 1911 guy says, You've often stated the dangers of entering the firearm industry, and despite this I still have chosen it as my career path. Uh, while working on firearms at all interests me, I would truly like to set up my own manufacturing and brand. The flagship product would essentially be a modernized HK P7 that would be built similar to a Glock and Glock magazine compatible, as well as offering benefits of a red dot, threaded muzzle, double stack mag capacity, etc. etc. Uh, do you think that there is enough interest in such a design, or that it would just end up buried under the plethora of other polymer frame designs? I do not think there is enough commercial interest to justify the manufacture of such a pistol. Uh, what you have described is sounds like an excellent gun. Um, however, it, uh, it has to be more than an excellent gun in order to be successful. It has to be an excellent gun that is cost competitive with the other excellent guns that we already have out there. And the notion of being able to put a brand new thing into production and be able to meet the, the cost of something that's been in production and been in development for multiple decades. Glocks came out in the early 80s. That's almost 40 years now, 30 to 40 years the Glocks have been around uh, developing economy of scale and refining the quality of their build. You're not going to compete with that as a brand new gun. Um, I think Hudson is an excellent example of that. Um, even before they shot themselves in the foot with their aluminum model, that gun wasn't exactly flying off the shelf. It was an expensive gun compared to what else was out there, and you had to convince people that it was worth spending the equivalent of two Glocks to get one Hudson. And that's a, a difficult uh, challenge. And so if you decide to do this, the one 1911 guy, I would strongly encourage you to have a backup plan and to make sure that should this attempt uh, crash and burn in debt and failure, uh, that you're not out on the street homeless as a result. Tim says, in your British SMG overview video, you mentioned that double stack single feed magazines, like on the Sten, are less reliable than double stack double feed magazines. Now, Double stack single feed mags are the norm for most pistols. What changed to make them more reliable? Nothing changed. Um, they are still the less desirable option. However, there is a matter of space, and in a handgun frame and slide, it's a lot more practical, especially if you want a relatively compact gun, to have a single feed magazine where you have literally half the width of breech face that you need in order to pick up a cartridge. If you notice the difficulty that a lot of pistols have getting reliable, like super extended magazines, that's in large part because they are single feed double stack mags. And those super extended mags are typically about 30 rounds. Well, how many, how many guns have difficulty creating a reliable 30 round magazine? Like every rifle out there runs on a reliable double feed 30 round magazine. Um, the single feed mags are in fact less reliable. However, when you cut them down to about half of that length, 15 to 18 rounds, which is what's typical uh, for modern semi-auto pistols, then you've gotten rid of most of the reliability problems just by making the, the thing shorter. You've reduced, the, basically you've reduced the problems involved in building it. And at that point, uh, it's worth doing because you have these other considerations of how wide the top of the magazine is and how much space you have available for your breech face and slide and frame interface. Uh, Ryan says, did any other military rifles or weapons of any kind uh, get chambered in 8mm Kurtz, uh, or did they ever get into service with the Wehrmacht even in small numbers, 
was the cartridge basically unique to the Sturmgewehr 44, and were any non-STG 44 weapons chambered in it post-war. Um, there were some other guns that used the 8mm Kurtz cartridge. Uh, the VG-15 did. That's probably the most uh, numerical, uh, very, very last ditch gun that used MP44 magazines. In fact, everything, virtually everything we see in German use that was 8 Kurtz all used the same magazine, which was a, a good idea in terms of logistics. They experimented with some bolt action rifles in 8 Kurtz with flush magazines as well. They did experiment with an 8 Kurtz FG42, but it never went anywhere, never went into production, it was just a prototype. Uh, Post-war, pretty much the same thing. Um, there were some experiments in different countries with 8mm Kurtz. Um, there was a very early FAL prototype in 8mm Kurtz. Um, I believe there was actually an EM2 prototype in 8mm Kurtz, believe it or not. And then like the Swiss didn't really use 8 Kurtz, but they, they kind of copied the idea and came up with their own seven, basically 7.5 seven Swiss Kurtz cartridge that they built some experimental guns in. Um, but there was never anything on the mass production scale of the MP44 slash MP43 slash STG44, which are all basically the same gun. Um, nothing else was ever made using that cartridge. The reason for that, yeah, I should say, is it's a pretty inefficient cartridge because it's a very large diameter case when it doesn't need to be. Like if you compare 8 Kurtz and 762 by 39 you can get the same case volume by making that cartridge just a little bit longer, which makes it significantly smaller in diameter, which means your magazines get shorter, and it just becomes a lot easier to work with. Uh, and so everyone who started experimenting with the intermediate caliber cartridge idea did so with brand new cartridges where the Germans had basically taken 8 Mauser and shortened it because they already had the tooling in place to do that easily. Joe says, what big bore pistols do you own, and are there any you'd like to own? There are a lot that would be kind of neat, but to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of big bore pistols. Um, they don't speak to me, so to speak. Um, I only really have one, and that's a Wildy Survivor. It's cool, it's very cool, but there's not a lot that I can do with it. Um, there are some people who are serious recoil junkies who love shooting that sort of stuff. It's not really me. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw them away if I happen to end up with some other ones. Probably the most interesting ones to me would be like the, the 577 Webley Price. That'd be awesome. That'd be really cool. But again, I don't think I'd do that much actual shooting with it. It'd just be cool. Uh, Keegan says, why is the US military always so stubborn about their service rifles also being target rifles? For example, the 1903 and 1917 over the M16A1 and A2. Uh, why would they take a less combat effective rifle over a more combat effective one? It's hard to believe that they care more about a rifle qualification score than combat efficiency. I don't know that that is all that hard to believe, although I think the core reason here is you have to have some way to quantify the capability of the gun. And it's hard to quantify combat effectiveness. You know, how, what are the metrics on that? How do you test for it? Whereas Accuracy on the known distance competition range is very easy to quantify, and we have a long tradition of individual marksmanship in the United States, uh, or at least we like to think that we do. Um, kind of we, we design things around that idea that the most effective infantryman is going to be the one who can hit the smallest target at the longest range. That is very intuitive. And how do you measure that? Well, you have a shooting competition with small targets at long range, and whatever does best there is probably the gun that you want to have. So it's, especially in peacetime, it's difficult to break out of that mold when what someone is presenting you is generally going to be a gun that shoots less well on the competition range. So, you know, how do you, how do you easily accept that? How do you go, well, we have this rifle where our average dude shoots a 95, but we're going to get rid of it in favor of this one that the average guy can shoot a 70 with. Obviously, you and I both realize that there are other factors that don't come into play on the competition range, but especially in peacetime it's hard to convince people of that. Uh, Minion says, what's the chance of you doing a collaborative video with Nick, aka The Chieftain? 
uh, I think very good. I don't know when it will happen, uh, but he and I have, have chatted on the phone. Um, I think there's great potential to do a collaboration there. It'd be fun to do some video on, from my perspective, some video on um, vehicle-based guns, you know, coaxial machine guns, tank-mounted machine guns. I already did one on the, the M, M231, the port-firing weapon from the Bradleys, but that sort of thing I think we could do a pretty cool collaboration on. I just don't know when it'll happen. He's a long ways away, and it just involves some organizational working out. Uh, Jason says, what's the best reference book on the history of the FN mag, especially non-US use? I don't know of one. Um, a lot of machine guns in particular, there really just aren't any particularly good books on them. Um, I do have a copy of Ars Mechanica, which is the corporate official history of FN. Uh, I flipped through it, it appears to have two pages on the FN mag, and most of them are taken up with pictures. So. Uh, right now your best source of information on the FN mag is going to be the internet. Jeff says, have you considered uh, or attempted contacting the publishers of out-of-print books that you review to see if they would be interested in doing a fresh timed run to go on sale with your video? Nope, I never have, basically because it's just too much organizational work. Um, to do a new printing of a book is going to require a couple months of, of advance notice to get it all done. And then having the um, the infrastructure in place to actually sell it. Most of these books are ones that were sold wholesale to various book distributors. That's a model that doesn't really work all that well anymore, or at least the internet has created a far better model for doing book sales. And a lot of the books that are out of print are out of print because they were printed several decades ago or more. And so the authors sometimes are just dead. And sometimes, more often, they're just not in a position to be able to take advantage of selling a, of reprinting a book to sell along with a video that I do. I'm also not entirely convinced that I have that much pull to make something like that financially worthwhile. Leslie asks, uh, why have top feeding light machine guns like the Bren and ZB26 fallen out of favor? Um, a couple reasons, I think, and not necessarily directly to do with the guns themselves. I think what's happened is the, the box magazine fed light machine gun has given way to the belt fed light machine gun, um, which of course belt feed is not going to be from the top, it's always going to be from the side. And what we, we also have gotten the, the basically universal adoption of small intermediate cartridges like 5.56 and 7.62 by 39. So with those early box top fed box fed light machine guns, they were in full size rifle cartridges. Uh, like 303, like 8 Mauser, and those have relatively large in diameter cartridges, and when you stack them up in magazines, you get relatively long magazines compared to, say, a 5.56. If you want a 30 round magazine, let's just say a BAR, a 30 round magazine on a BAR sticks way out the bottom of that gun, and once you start messing around with one of those, it immediately becomes a little more clear why they would go with a top feed design instead. Then you can put a 20 or 30 round magazine on top of the gun and not have any problem getting a nice low position or angling the gun up uh, without hitting on the magazine. So when we move from those major caliber cartridges to like 5.56, now your 30 round magazine is substantially shorter and it's easier to put it in the bottom of a gun without having those same problems. But I think more substantially the tactical role that those guns played has been replaced with belt heads. Um, in fact, there are very few rifle caliber. In fact, I don't know that there are any rifle caliber magazine fed squad automatic light machine gun type guns out there in service today. I'm sure there are a few. I guess like North Korea has one, but they don't count. That's not modern. Um, so. uh, Darius says With the impending adoption of the NGSW concept and the new 6.8 millimeter cartridge in the US, do you think there will be any chance for a stoner-like modular firearm? And I'm going to cut this off there because I think that 6.8 or 6.5 millimeter cartridge idea is never going to come to fruition. I don't think it is practically capable. I think it, the, the concept and the desired outcome right now pretty much violates the laws of physics. Um, as I am aware of it, what they're looking for is like a 139 grain bullet at over 3,000 feet per second from a shoulder-fired selective fire infantry rifle, and I don't think that can conceivably happen. I could see it in a machine gun 
of the size of a PK or an FN mag, perhaps. But I don't think it will be in any sort of modular platform because I don't think it is feasible for an infantry rifle or infantry carbine or submachine gun or anything short of basically a general purpose machine gun. Um, I don't think it'll actually happen. I think we have a long and storied tradition of army interest and army trials that do not choose a new gun, and I think this will be one more of them. Uh, John says, why do you think the Walther MPL slash MPK was unsuccessful? Bad timing or a fault in the design? Um, I think this is very similar to what I just said about the, 19, the one 1911 guy's plans to make a new pistol. I think when the Walther machine, submachine gun came out, there were a lot of other options for submachine guns. There were some that were really good, like HK's MP5. And Walther didn't really offer any, any huge reason why you should buy their gun instead of somebody else's. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. There's just nothing necessarily better about it. Um, beyond some aspects of personal taste. So it doesn't, it would have really surprised me had it been commercially very successful. The only way it could have been would be to be extremely cheap, and I don't think you're going to see that out of a German produced gun. Uh, Kayla says, let's say you have a firearm that's rare, obscure, and has no part support in the US, a part breaks. Where do you go to get it fixed? Are there gunsmiths who specialize in making one-off parts and doing these sorts of repairs? Yes, there are. Um, I know one uh, whose work I have used in the past once or twice. They are typically guys who are like retired tool and die makers. They are extremely talented. They are extremely expensive because they are not dependent on doing this sort of work. Uh, they do it because they enjoy doing it, and so they don't necessarily want to do a lot of it. And so they charge an arm and a leg to ensure that not a lot of people are going to be calling them up every day, pestering them to do boring projects. They only want to do interesting projects. Um, probably the, the most public sort of person like this that I've ever come in contact with is Mark Novak at Anvil Gunsmithing. Um, and in fact, I'm, uh, I'm a little surprised by how public he is about what he does and how much of it he does. I think it's extremely cool. Uh, he's a very talented guy and does some great work. Uh, beyond that, it's typically kind of a word of mouth thing of you start poking around for, you know, I broke X, who can fix that? And if you've got the right social circles of, you know, oh, I know a guy who knows a guy who does that, uh, you know, and he's a 112 year old tool and die maker from you know the Stone Age. Those are typically the guys you want, um, as long as they're cool, as long as they're like organized enough to not just lose your project and die in ten years, and then your your part sitting there in a box, which is not an unheard of situation. In fact, that's a very real hazard of dealing with this sort of thing. Um, younger gunsmiths typically don't have the expertise or don't have the name recognition. You know, there's not a ton of this work out there to do. People generally aren't, were, aren't willing to pay for a lot of this sort of work. So it's high-end stuff that requires high-end people who don't tend to advertise. Nick wants to know, what is my preferred brand of gin? Uh, his is Citadel, mine is Plymouth Navy Strength. Uh, Lewis says, Fearless explorer Ian McCollum has a map to the lost mines of Cordoba and is leading an expedition traveling in a light bush plane. But oh no, the engine has conked out and stranded the party in the North American wilderness, days away from civilization and a cell phone signal. The intrepid McCollum assures all will be well because he has packed his trusty... what? First answer is satellite phone. But since this is specifically about guns, I was torn between two different answers, one of them being like one of the, there are a number of, of custom lever actions in like 444 Marlin made um, up in the, the Northwest and Alaska for bears. That's an interesting answer, but I would be very tempted instead to go the route of a 6.5 Creedmoor Steyr Scout rifle. Um, in fact, I'm looking in, I, I'm very curious about actually trying one of those out because I think this is exactly the sort of situation that that rifle is kind of ideal for. It's a cartridge that 
you know, it, it would not be my first choice if I was going on a safari in Africa and had to shoot, you know, some 4,000 pound carnivore. Um, nor, of course, would it be my first choice to shoot a rabbit or a squirrel, but it's kind of a cartridge that will pretty much do anything, especially in North America. 6.5 Creedmoor would be fine on basically anything here short of grizzly bears or polar bears, and if you're just in a self-defense, oh crap, there's a grizzly bear charging me, there's a lot worse to have than a 6.5 Creedmoor, and you're not quite so much concerned about getting a purely ethical hunting one-shot kill, uh, you want that thing to not eat you. Uh, and I think 6.5 Creedmoor would be effective enough at that. Um, yeah, I and then I like the idea of the gun being very portable. I think that's something that a lot of people overlook because I don't think a lot of people are out there actually carrying rifles around for extended periods of time outside of a military environment where they don't get any choice in what they're carrying anyway. And having a lighter gun is often a good thing. So I will tentatively say 6.5 Steyr Scout. Um, now if someone wants to invite me on such an expedition and call my bluff and see if that's actually the gun I bring, you're welcome to do it. My email address is admin at Forgotten Weapons, and it sounds like a fascinating trip to take. James says, what is the weirdest or most unique operating system for a firearm that you've run into? I actually have an excellent answer for this. I was recently um, at the Institute of Military Technology, uh, which is uh, Reed Knight's collection and small arms museum. Uh, which is incidentally where I was doing the shooting with the light assault machine gun. But one of the things that he pointed out to me is I did a video a little while back on a gun that I, a, a prototype semi-auto conversion of a Springfield that I described as being primer activated. And he has said rifle now, and he took a closer look at it and did spent more time on it certainly than I did and found the patent for it as well and realized that that thing is actually an operating system that is based on cartridge case stretch. It's not actually the primer that moves back in the cartridge case that, that works that gun. It is the entire case head setting back like two millimeters when you fire. So it's like a, a, a headspace activated action, which is really interesting. And when I have my next opportunity to go there and have time to do some real filming, um, this last thing was just like a little one day trip, when I have a chance to do real filming there next, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later, I'm going to revisit that gun. Um, and a second one he has of a very similar operating system um, and correct my previous video. And I can also add a bunch of information because now having access to the patent, I know who the guy was who invented it and exactly how it was supposed to work. And the idea of an action based on stretching cases and over length headspace is kind of both terrifying and fascinating at the same time. Definitely the most unique one that I can think of ever having run into. Robert says, where do you see forgotten weapons in five years? Will there be more people aboard covering different weapons? Will you have editors and a team of people? I have no idea. Um, it would be very exciting to me to be able to expand this into more of an organization. Uh, in particular, I would love to be able to have the time uh, or opportunity to kind of do more of what I started out doing, which was documents and photographs and making more of an encyclopedia instead of a strictly video-based system, which is what this has turned into. Um, video has been the best way forward, but if I had a clone that I could set to work doing the website, uh, doing more archival documentation on the website, I would love to do that. The idea of setting up an organization and having like a team, an international team of people contributing material and turning forgotten weapons into a massive universal resource is incredibly exciting to me, but I have no idea at this point exactly how I would make that work. So I have no idea. I don't really have a clear picture of where I will be in five years or where forgotten weapons will be in five years. I'm kind of more of a mindset to plan a year or two in advance and just kind of follow where it takes me. Charles says, does your outspoken support for individual gun rights and gun ownership ever cause you problems with gaining access to collections? While I imagine this wouldn't be a problem when viewing individual collections, I could see some potential problems with gaining access to official collections, particularly in countries with much more restrictive laws than the United States. That's an interesting question. 
Um, it has never been an issue for me whatsoever. Um, what you find is that even in the most restrictive of countries, the people who are curating or you know, administering major firearms collections are people who recognize and appreciate the value of those collections. Whether they think those guns should be uh, accessible for ownership by private individuals or not, in my experience, those people universally think that these, are a these firearms are a valuable part of history and that there is no reason why people should not know more about them. And so I've never had any uh, pushback from the way I see it. I'm not, I'm going in there on a basis of, I would like to uh, help publicize and document and spread the information, this historical information that you are curating and have collected uh, in this, whatever the collection is. And I've never had objection to that from anyone who's actually closely attached to the collection. Bureaucracies sometimes, yeah, uh, yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten problems from bureaucracy, but that's never on a basis of anything specifically about guns. Um, it's usually about things like licensing fees and editorial control and that sort of thing. Even that I've gotten only a little bit of ever. Uh, Ryan says, given how short Germany was on weapons later in World War II, was there any attempt to utilize the massive stockpiles of French rifles and machine guns they certainly captured during the opening stages of the war? Uh, yeah, they actually did. Um, <clears throat> and not just French, but largely French. Um, it was... A lot of foreign firearms were used for second-line troops, for... Uh, troops who were stationed in defensive areas where they really didn't expect to get attacked, um, specifically to free up the standard issue German weapons for use on combat fronts. And so Chatellerot machine guns, um, Berthier carbines, even Shoshas. There's, there's a couple famous pictures out there of um, a German SS detachment. And these are official German pictures um, of like four or five SS dudes with Berthier carbines and a Shosha 8mm Lebel Shosha light machine gun doing field exercises. Um, and you'll find R35 shortened Lebels. Uh, yeah, they used foreign weapons fairly extensively. Uh, on the Russian front there was reasonably extensive use, especially early on, of uh, SVT-40 rifles. Um, before the G-43 was really in common use, uh, Russian submachine guns were used. Italian submachine guns were used, and that was even on an official basis. They were buying guns from Beretta. Um, and then at the end of the war, the Volkssturm used literally anything they could get their hands on. There are pictures out there of Volkssturm guys with Carcanos and anything that was accessible. So yeah, um, the Germans actually did quite a bit of, of use of foreign weapons in areas where they weren't really expected to be used, because the logistical issues were not so much having access to the guns, because it's not that difficult to have a big stockpile of guns, but the ammunition is a major issue. They didn't want to have to like start production of foreign ammunition. So once you use up that stockpile, then you have a problem, because if you've issued, let's say you, you issue um, Chatellero light machine guns to some Wehrmacht division going off to fight in Russia, well, either you're going to start production of 7.5 French ammunition for those guns, or you just ship them the stockpile that you captured, well what happens when those guys use up that ammo? Now, now they're in a far worse place because they can't resupply from any other unit that you've got. Uh, you have to either start making the ammo and ship it to them, or you have to give them a whole new batch of machine guns, and you do not want to be in a position where you've got like some guys that got into combat and they're, you know, they can win if they only get one more shipment of ammunition and oops, you've got no ammo and you have to give them new guns too. Uh, Derek asks, uh, Ian, have you ever run into the Steyrhan machine pistol from World War I and will we see a video? No, I've never seen one. Um, everybody on the internet is very, very familiar with them. They are very popular on the internet, but I have had a hard time even finding, a per finding anyone who has seen one themselves. Uh, in circles of like serious museum people and high-end gun researchers. So it seems pretty clear that such a thing was actually made, but I don't think very many of them were made. 
If I ever get my hands on one, you bet, I will absolutely do a video. It'd be pretty cool to finally be able to do a video on that, but I'm not in super optimistic that I'll ever actually find one. I don't know how many of them actually survive. Uh, da, 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 da. Next up, Peter says, well, I can't claim to have seen every Forgotten Weapons video. I think I'm getting pretty close. And while we've seen nested recoil springs, I've never seen any firearm use a graduated slash variable slash irregular pitch recoil spring. Do production costs outweigh possible reliability or wear or recoil benefits? Do gun designers just not bother? Um, without having a, you know, a, a specific college class on variable pitch springs, I suspect that the reason is there is no free lunch. And if you have X length of space in order to decelerate your bolt, you can decelerate it slowly at first and, and quickly at the end. But you don't really gain anything from that. Like if you don't have enough space to completely decelerate the bolt with a, a standard, uh, you know, a, a, a fixed pitch recoil spring, uh, spring you're not going to be able to do it with a variable pitch one. And you don't really benefit from the bolt accelerating quickly or you're decelerating slowly at first and then more quickly at the end. I think there's just not, well, it's a cool mechanical thing. I don't think it actually provides a particular tangible benefit in a firearm. I could be wrong on that. Um, it's not something I've really thought about in depth before, but that's what I think the answer is. Jim says, with the advent of uh, bump stocks being declared machine guns, does this mean they will someday appear on forgotten weapons? Um, and can slash will slash did people get tax stamps on their bump stocks to keep them as legally registered machine guns? Um, so first off, no. Um, the ban on bump stocks, the redefinition of bump stocks as machine guns did not come with any legal opportunity to register them because the machine gun registry was closed in 86. In theory, you could register a bump stock, but you could only do so if you are a licensed machine gun manufacturer and it would be a post sample bump stock, uh, which I'm sure someone has done somewhere, uh, but certainly not in any particular number. And for the average dude who bought a bump stock, no, there is no way to legally keep it. However, I have very little doubt that that bump stock ban will be bouncing through the court system for at least a couple of years. Um, at the present time, possession of bump stocks is illegal uh, if they are not registered, and they can't be registered, so they're illegal. Um, I suspect what's going to happen is eventually that ban will probably get overturned on the basis that that's not how you change the law and you can't do it that way. It is interesting to note that even Dianne Feinstein at one point came out uh, against that bump stock ban on the basis that that's not really how you're supposed to do it and it will result in it getting tied up in the court system for years and probably getting overturned eventually. So it will be not surprising to me if that happens that a bunch of bump stocks come back out from being underground because I don't think very many people are actually destroying them or getting rid of them. Uh, will we see them on Forgotten Weapons? No, specifically because YouTube itself has a policy of not allowing video of bump stocks and they don't have the sort of granular interest or control to give a crap if it happens to be a legally registered one as a dealer sample by some SOT. They don't care. If they see a bump stock video, they will delete it and they will put a strike on your channel. Um, there was some bump stock content on Forgotten Weapons, and when all of this started, I deleted those couple of videos because the alternative was basically risking having the channel deleted. So they will not be showing up on Forgotten Weapons. Um, and I no longer have any. I got rid of mine because, uh, well, I understand why some people are going to put them in a bag in the back of the closet and just pretend that they never existed. Um, as someone who has substantial public visibility in this space, the last thing I want to do is have an illegal machine gun. So mine are gone. Uh, Chatty. Oh, no, sorry. Julian. I skipped Julian. Julian says, I noticed on a bunch of recent shooting videos, you haven't been using your custom molded earplugs. Any reason for that? Yeah, I lost one of them. It was really annoying. Um, I kind of pulled them halfway out at a match uh, during a ceasefire so I could 
I was talking to a bunch of people and one of them fell out and fell under a shooting bench. And I spent about 15 minutes looking for it and I have no freaking idea where it went. And it's really annoying and I just haven't had the opportunity to get a new set made and so I haven't been using them. Um, I originally had that first set made at the, the first Desert Brutality match and uh, we had a vendor, a lady who showed up making them on site for people and it was awesome. The second Desert Brutality we did not have a person like that show up so I had been hoping to get a set made there, didn't have the chance and I don't know, at some point I need to find a place where I can actually have another set made but I just haven't had the chance yet. Chatty says, do you have plans post Forgotten Weapons? Love the content and don't want to see it end though. I guess I kind of talked about this already. I don't have post Forgotten Weapons plans because I have no plans to stop doing what I'm doing now. Um, like I said, I kind of operate on this plan of figure out a year or two in advance, um, not try to plan out farther than that because planning out farther than that in this sort of grand style doesn't seem to me to be very practical. Like it hasn't worked out for me in the past. I've I've previously made such plans and they just, you know, life always changes and five years down the road you're not in the same place and you don't have the same goals. So um, I tell you what, it would be fun to do a cocktail channel. I would enjoy that. There's no way that I have time to do a cocktail channel right now though. So who knows? Charlie, uh, why do you think there aren't as many guns, specifically machine guns, that use the constant recoil system found in the Knight's Armament Light Assault Machine Gun? Uh, that one's come up several times today. First off, that is a system that is only, only has validity in an actual machine gun. In a semi-auto rifle, constant recoil is a moot point. So the idea with constant recoil, it's different than balanced recoil. So some of the new Russian prototypes that have balanced recoil are actually reducing the felt recoil of the very first shot that you fire. Constant recoil does not. The idea with constant recoil is that you do not get a, a, like a repeated impact on your shoulder as each round fires and causes the gun to do this, bang, 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 bang. Instead, you have basically a constant force exerted on your shoulder as you fire. The bolt is steadily decelerated and comes to a stop before actually contacting the back of the receiver. So when you first pull the trigger on a constant recoil gun, it's going to kick, it's going to come back, and then it's going to continue pushing back like a fire hose uh, until you stop shooting. And then in order to hold it on target, you will have started putting force back, you know, equal and opposite force back on the gun to hold it in place. When you release the trigger, you then tend to see the shooter kind of clunk forward a little bit because they're still pushing on the gun and the gun stops pushing back. It's not the same as a flinch, by the way but it looks the same and a lot of people mistake the two. Anyway, so has only full auto. In fact, constant recoil doesn't really do a whole lot with short bursts either. If you're firing a two or three round burst, you don't really get as much benefit out of constant recoil. The longer you're holding the trigger down, the more, the more you see that benefit. So most of the guns that are being designed out there are being designed primarily for semi-auto fire or very short controlled groups. And that limits the the pool of potential guns for constant recoil systems. That said, it actually surprises me as well that there aren't more people doing that. Um, and I honestly don't have a good answer for why there aren't. Um, best thing I could come up with is that a lot of these guns are basically old legacy systems. There aren't a whole lot of brand new light slash medium machine guns. By the way, the constant recoil thing is also really only applicable to a shoulder fired gun. Because if you're going to put the thing on a tripod or a pintle mount, you don't really need constant recoil because you've got this big heavy mount that's absorbing that recoil anyway and you don't care. So there aren't a whole lot of brand new guns being developed in this relatively narrow field where constant recoil applies and maybe that's the explanation right there. You know the, the FN 249 has been around for a long time and it doesn't seem to be cost effective for FN to produce a brand new gun to replace it. Maybe if they did they would give it some constant recoil principles. Uh, next up is Robert. You often say that forgotten weapons were forgotten for a reason and that there were several reasons for adopting a gun, quality, price, foreign versus domestic, etc. Um, but what adoption was the most puzzling for you? I.e. was there a, there was a better slash cheaper slash more local gun in the trials that 
for no clear reason, lost to something else. Um, the best example I can come up with of a weird result in a trials program isn't really a trials program so much as a development program, and that's the British L85. The SA80 program is a complete dumpster fire, and it's really remarkable to me how much of a dumpster fire it was. Um, I can understand the gun having developmental problems, but the, the, the fact that they were allowed to not just stick around but multiply, like the farther they got through the development of the L85, the worse that gun got. That's really remarkable to me. And I can kind of see how it happened, like I can understand the rationalization, even though I think it's nonsense, um, in that it was a matter of sunk cost and national pride, and the fact that, hey, we have this national arsenal and that's what their job is supposed to be, and if we acknowledge that they can't do that job, then we're opening this big old can of worms, so better off to pretend that the gun works and not have to deal with why is this design incompetent. But someone really, there really should have been some whistleblower at some level who went, okay, wait, 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 this is crap, and we're putting the army, like individual soldiers, at serious personal risk by giving them this crap gun. And it never happened. Like, it, didn't, it took Desert Storm to really bring that to light. That's the most remarkable adoption that I can think of. Peter asks, which of the major participants in the Great War had the best balance of small arms, i.e. sidearms all the way through heavy machine guns of the conflict? I thought about this, and I'm going to say the British, the United Kingdom. <clears throat> um, I don't think their rifle was the best. I think the best rifle of the war was the 1917 Enfield, uh, fielded by the Americans. Now the British did have some 1914 Enfields that are similar, um, but in a worse cartridge. And the British revolvers are, eh, like I'd rather have a Luger or a 1911 than a Webley revolver. But I think the most important two guns of the conflict were the heavy machine gun and the light machine gun. And the British had, by, had the best of the light machine guns, uh, certainly in terms of when you combine quality and quantity. Not like, did they have five of the best design, but the sum total of their light machine guns were the best sum total of any nation's light machine guns, and those are the Lewis guns. And then the Vickers heavy machine gun is an outstanding gun itself. Uh, it's better than the Maxims. It is you know, a further iterative development of the Maxim gun. I have recently started to have some second thoughts about comparing the, the Maxim with the, the air-cooled Hotchkiss guns, heavy guns. I think there's a lot going for the Hotchkiss guns that maybe I hadn't considered previously, just from their simplicity. Those things just freaking work, um, where Maxims and Vickers are delightful machines, but they always leak water. Maybe they didn't so much a hundred years ago, but today they always leak water. They kind of always take a little bit of tuning to get running right. Um, they certainly can run fantastically well once they're tuned. But I get the feeling that with the Hotchkiss you get the same result, but you don't have to do the tuning. Now I'd rather have belt fed than strip, so maybe there's a balance there. But overall, getting back to the question, the best overall balance of guns in World War I? British. And it's because of the Lewis gun, closely followed by the Vickers gun. The Lee Enfield was not a bad rifle, um, but not quite as good as some of the others. And the pistols don't really matter. Clement says, if World War I had broken out earlier, when the French had a significant technological lead on the development of smokeless powder, do you think they would have successfully pulled off their military doctrine of attack à a You know, just élan, and attack at all costs. That is a very interesting question. And I think the answer is not really. Um, the, the two weapons that made that French strategy not work were artillery and machine guns. And there was a very, very small time period when the French really actually had a lead. In fact, when it comes to machine guns, the French didn't have a lead. By the time the French were adopting heavy machine guns, everyone else already had Maxim guns as well. Um, and the artillery, well, the French didn't really take advantage of their advantage uh, in the artillery anyway. So no, I think 
if there was a time when when that strategy would have actually worked, it would have been a time before uh, smokeless powder. Because without smokeless powder, you can't have machine guns. And the only way that French strategy of the offensive could have worked would be if there were no machine guns. Gray says, which is better, HK irons or AR-15 style irons, and why is the answer HK? Sorry, the answer is not HK. I hate HK iron sights. That little drum with one notch and three apertures. For whatever reason, I can't use that for crap. And I don't really know why, but it's, I've, it's not one gun, it's every gun I've ever tried that thing on. I just really dislike it, and I really prefer AR-15 style iron sights. <clears throat> Scott says, after witnessing the results of Project Lightning and noting the rarity and fragility of the mags, it made me want to see if it would be possible to use a type of modern nylon fusion 3D printing I use for similar applications to make polymer mags for some of these old guns like the Shosha. Would you have any faith or interest in helping to test such endeavors? Ooh, excuse me. I would be happy to test uh, such endeavors, but I don't have a whole lot of faith that they will turn out well. Um, it's possible that I'm just not up to speed on modern 3D printing materials, but I have a hard time picturing, like, the problem with the Shosha mag is primarily one of very thin sheet metal. And you can't really make the mag much bigger and still have it fit into the gun. Um, you know, it has to be a certain dimension internally for the cartridge to feed through it, and it has to be a certain dimension externally in order to fit into the magazine well, and that really limits the thickness of the material you can use. And if steel wasn't strong enough, I just can't picture 3D printed plastic being strong enough. So I'm I'm happy to, you know, if someone wants to try making that some of those old mags, I'm happy to test them out. But I don't really think they're going to work. And it, to me, it, because of that, I don't see it as really a solution uh, for some of these guns that have very rare magazines. Uh, Nate, 762 Nate, says, after the advent of smokeless powder, why was every major military looking to get a self-loading rifle but not a self-loading handgun? Um, actually, I think this is a misconception. Um, automatic handguns were more prevalent shortly after, in the immediate aftermath of smokeless powder being developed than self-loading rifles. Um, everyone immediately looked for a bolt-action rifle using the new powder, and uh, but there wasn't that much, there was very little successful development of self-loading rifles around that time period, while there was a lot of successful development of self-loading pistols. Um, by 1900 you had a whole bunch of successful self-loading pistols. Um, ten year, within 10 years of smokeless powder being developed, we've got the broom handle Mauser. Uh, just a couple years after that we've got the Luger, and those are very, the Luger is basically a modern pistol. By 1900, um, well, you also have the Browning 1900, which is a totally modern pistol. Um, it was the self-loading rifles that would take a lot longer. Uh, you had the very first really like large-scale production one with the 1908 Mondragon, but you don't have you don't have a major military mass adoption of a semi-auto rifle until the 1930s, where you have mass adoption of semi-auto pistols by militaries as, you know, in the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, the, the PO-8 Luger, 1908, the Germans are adopting semi-auto pistols. And our very last question is from Aki. It says, being from Finland, I have to ask the fundamental question. Have you, and Carl, had the chance to try a real sauna, and if so, how did you like it? Yes, I have. Um, in fact, when I went to Finland, we were given no choice but to try out a real sauna, and I actually found that I enjoyed it a fair amount. And when I have the opportunity to, which isn't all that often here in the United States, but when I have the chance, I do enjoy using them still. And every time, well, I've only been back to Finland once, but I very much enjoyed uh, using sauna back in Finland again. Um, I think maybe just the fact that I properly call it sauna uh, in the, the Finnish pronunciation. I Yeah, I do like it. It'd be really cool to have one in my own house, although I don't know if that's ever going to be feasible. But it's something I would love to have if I could. So uh, anyone else out there who has never tried sauna, um, I would encourage you to try it. I would uh, 
find a fin and just get them to introduce you to it because they'll do it right and you won't have to worry about like, oh I went to a wimpy sauna in some lame hotel that was way too cold. Find a fin, they'll do it right. And on that note, that is it for another monthly Q&A. A big thank you to all of you folks on Patreon who made this possible um, and who supplied questions. I apologize if I didn't get your question in. I had literally hundreds of questions and my voice is already starting to go after just four and a half pages of them. So uh, we'll do this again next, next month and we'll have another batch of questions for you. Thanks for watching.